Oh, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for your patience <laughs> with all the technical issues. Um, and so my name is Joanna Socha and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of women-oriented platform W Insight. And I have a great pleasure of introducing our special guest today, who is uh, Milena Olszewska Mishugis. Um, Milena has such an enormous experience uh, in the world of finance that it's difficult to even introduce her in a few words, but we can definitely say she is a leader in her field. Uh, she is the CEO of a boutique advisory company, WM Advisory, where she supports the management of listed and non-listed companies. She advises them on a var variety of topics, including sustainability <laughs> and she is also a member of the corporate governance Com um, committee on the warsaw stock exchange apart from that she is behind the recently launched 30 percent club poland working towards including more women at board and senior management levels valuations and financial analysis expert milena holds all the certificates possible such as CFA, ACCA, and FCA <laughs> credential. Uh, so hi, Milena, it's so great to have you here. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello everyone. Great to be here. Thank you uh, for, the, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure uh, to be able to share my experiences and to support this wonderful project. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start with a question about the beginning of your professional path. Um, your career in finance, as we all know, is extraordinary, but I was wondering what was your um, career planning approach? Like, did you have a clear path from the very beginning or, or you were making decisions on the go? Well, I think um, when you're young and when you're studying, it's, um, it's a tricky one to actually have all your career planned out. I knew I wanted to study at Warsaw, Stock, uh, Warsaw School of Economics. Um, I knew I wanted to work in finance, but when I was studying, it wasn't obvious for me what I wanted to do after school. So I was looking as much as uh, possible for various experiences and trying to find my way. I decided that uh, you know one major was not enough, so I thought I'm going to do two master degrees because then at least I will have covered some bases. And my thinking while studying uh, was that I, I wanted to be a quant. So I loved quantitative methods and I thought I will be valuing complex financial instruments and i even won a mathematical contest i went to ey to a specialized unit that was valuing financial instruments and it turned out that it's not a place for me that uh, instead of that on top of excel i needed human contact so um, i decided to use the second major that uh, i was uh, doing on my studies investment banking and uh, inspired by a good friend of mine, I actually filed uh, my CV to a brokerage house. And that was uh, the right move. Uh, I became an equity analyst. That means I started valuing those companies that are listed on stock exchange. In that case, on our Warsaw stock exchange. And I was uh, issuing recommendations whether someone should buy, sell or hold uh, those stocks. So that clearly turned out to be a place for me. So you can say that that, uh, that wasn't planned, but later on, all the moves that I've done as equity analyst, I tried to do them um, in, a, in a way that was planned. So I knew that I wanted to use opportunities. I knew that I was moving towards uh, bigger uh, brokerage houses, that I wanted to speak to more clients, that I wanted to cover more important stocks. So as to have more impact. So at the beginning, um, it was that I needed a bit of luck uh, to get to uh, to that part of finance, uh, which turned out to be a passion of mine. But later on, I tried to as much as possible to use opportunities that uh, that uh, brokerage houses, that uh, international brokerage houses gave me. What were some of 
the major challenges you face when um, working towards a career in financial industry and how did you overcome those challenges? Working as an equity analyst uh, is challenging. So it's a type of job uh, where you work long hours, uh, where you work under pressure, uh, when you issue ratings, recommendations, and um, on important stocks, so some people benefit, some people lose, uh, because of your ratings. And it was uh, my challenge, uh, although I really loved my work, my challenge was work-life uh, work balance. That the more companies I was covering, the better analyst I was, the more clients I had, the more my voice was heard on the capital market, the more work I had and uh, my day well didn't expand so it was still the same 24 hours that we all have and I was um, I was fighting with my perfectionism that I wanted to have everything done greatly so um, I tried to of course I tried to delegate I tried to um, find ways to solve this dilemma but overall, after a decade on capital markets, uh, having achieved everything that I could achieve uh, in my career, I actually decided to make my own path. So my solution was actually creating my own path, starting to be an entrepreneur. I saw opportunities. I knew that if I continue to be an equity analyst, then that will be just it. But then opportunities were opening in terms of advisory, uh, so I decided to use my knowledge, uh, to use my strengths and to go for uh, launching a company and actually advising those companies that I have been valuing uh, in the past. So but this you, is how... You quit your job. Yes, I, I quit my job. Uh, I quit my job uh, and I decided to start having... Um, to start also doing what I wanted because uh, having my own company allowed me for a different approach to time, allowed me to different approach uh, to other initiatives that I want to that I want to run. That was not possible when I was uh, when I was working in a corporation, but now being the master of my time. Uh, I was able to develop, I was able to do more certificates, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I was able to meet new people, I was able to develop, and that development was, and it is very important for me. Uh, I'm wondering about, you know, switching from the, you know, the brokerage house to uh, your own company. Like, how did you know it was the right moment, and did you have a safety net or something, like you knew you were going to make it, you know, uh, on your own? Hmm. You know, somehow I had that feeling that I will make it, that uh, the capital markets have always, in, in Poland, the, that people have always been so nice to me, uh, that, uh, that I would feel that reassuring uh, voice from them. Uh, so I, I knew, I knew that after a decade, I wanted to move on and I was looking for that, for that spot. Uh, and my own company provided uh, provided that. Of course, it's not easy being an entrepreneur. So you uh, there is no corporation, but then you have to look out for yourself. You have to um, find out uh, you know how to approach clients, how to sign contracts, how to negotiate contracts, how to value uh, your time. Uh, but that was all very interesting. And, um, and I really, really liked it and it gives you that opportunity to actually bond with people on a different level. And what was important uh, for me, for my company and for the success of that company was that I stayed within capital markets. So I moved on to a different position, but I didn't leave the industry. So I was still in a, in a spot that I like very much, that I know uh, a lot about, but I just... Uh, had a different function. I just have a different function now. Great, great. And so now moving into your women-oriented projects, you are involved in a number of women-oriented projects. One of them is 30% Club Poland. Mm, this initiative aims to improve the situations of women in finance and on boards overall. 
And uh, could you talk a little bit about the situation of women on capital markets and what women on boards in Poland? What trends do you see? And I suppose these trends are not um, maybe positive. So how do you hope to change them? That's one of the benefits of uh, having uh, your own company that you can uh, that you can uh, you can engage. And for me, starting to run uh, women-oriented initiatives was very important. I, I actually had to fly over the Atlantic Ocean for a conference in Boston to find my voice and to realize that uh, such initiatives were needed uh, in Poland. Because while working on capital markets, I just got used to being one, the only women or one of very few women uh, that were uh, within a room or were uh, held a seat uh, at a table. And uh, while seeing, once I flew on a conference that was devoted to gender and impact of uh, gender on returns that portfolio managers are generating, I realized that uh, that those actions uh, can have impact on companies, that you actually can uh, improve decision making, that you can improve performance by, uh, by having more diverse people that are taking decisions. And for me, that was an important step that started that I decided to actually meet more women. Uh, and I decided to gather women uh, around um, various initiatives so that we can meet one another and there is strength in numbers so once you meet once you uh, once you meet people who uh, who think um, that they can achieve that they can change things then you start thinking okay what can you change and for many girls uh, related to capital and financial markets that are behind 30 percent club poland initiative that was the starting place because 30 percent club it's a, a social campaign. It's a campaign that was started in 2010 by Helena Morrissey, who was a fund manager and later a CEO. And she also saw what I was seeing and many of uh, girls volunteers for the campaign, that there are very few women that actually have a seat at the table that are on management boards and supervisory boards. And she decided to change it by engaging both genders, so engaging women, but also men. So engaging people who sit at the very top of the hierarchies in corporates. And, uh, and the idea of 30% Club is to set targets, is to, for diversity to be measured. Because when something is measured, then something is done. And then you set targets and the 30%, it actually comes from a theory that's called critical mass theory. There has been quite extensive research done on the critical mass theory in terms of politics, in terms of social um, elements, but it basically says that any minority can have a voice and thus can have influence once it reaches a certain critical mass. And it's um, not entirely certain what that percentage is, but very often it is stated that it is 30%. So that's the idea that women should have at least 30% representation on the boards of companies because then they will be able to have an impact. And there have been studies done worldwide on thousands of companies and they have been repeated over the years uh, that companies uh, who, that have more diverse uh, boards, that they perform better, that they have higher margins, they have lower debt, uh, they have higher valuations, and you can read about it in Credit Suisse or in McKinsey reports that there is that diversity dividend that companies are getting. And this is what also 30% Club is about, that diversity can have measurable benefits and that having more diverse boards, it's actually not a women issue, it's a business issue. And that is the approach that actually resonated with so many CEOs. You know, when Helena Morrissey was starting in 2010 in the UK, women uh, took up 12.5% of FTSE 100 companies. A decade later, it's more than 30%. And it's not only in FTSE 100, but it's also in FTSE 350, so a larger index. So uh, this engagement of people in the top setting the targets, uh, it was 
was one of the elements, an important element that contributed to that success. And I was fortunate to gather a group of really wonderful people who decided to bring that campaign to Poland. And there's a lot to be done in Poland because at the end of 2020, in 140 largest companies that are listed on our stock exchange, women constituted 15.5% of boards. So there is a long way to go. And as you said, what we want to change, well, that's what we want to change. We have a target that we would want women to constitute at least 30% in 2030. So that's a long-term uh, target. Uh, and we also have an interim target that we want to engage um, uh, people in the key decision-making so that in 2025, there are no more corporates out of those most important, those larger ones, that are, have just all male boards and that women constitute at least 20% of those boards in 2025. And just to give you some numbers, one fourth of those 140 largest companies didn't have any women on board, neither in management board or in the supervisory board. And women were CEOs of only 4% of those companies. And only in 15% of the cases, women was the chair of the supervisory board. So there is a lot to change, and this is what we want to address. We want to be showing the benefits of diversity, we want to share um, experiences, experiences of those companies, those CEOs who have already went through that path, who've been successful. Mm, and this is what we want to, this is how we want to bring uh, change in Poland. Wow, thank you so much. This is, this is so fascinating. And I really wish that by 2050, 2030, we are going to, <laughs> to achieve that. Um, so, Imagine this scenario, let's say I'm the CEO of an, uh, or a partner of an investment fund in Poland. And I've heard that, you know, the more women we have uh, in our team, I'm not even talking about the board, just in, in the team, the more women we have, the better. But I struggle with hiring women and it's not my fault. I'm, I'm really trying, I'm not discriminating. Um, I, you know, the job posting is there, everybody can read it, but only men apply. Like, it's not my fault, I don't know what to do about it. What would you, what would you say to me? Well, I would say that uh, you've already taken an important step and that you've realized that you need uh, more diverse uh, management board, more diverse board or people within decision-making roles. And I would say that the first thing would be to set a target so that because really if something is measured it is get done so to set a target how diverse you would want your board your company to be and then there are really various measures that you can take and it's not a problem that is um, that only has one solution so i would say that you can approach it by looking at uh, why women are not applying whether it's uh, the industry or whether it's uh, related to your company only. Because um, if you look at a company from the outside, so how a women or how any minority is supposed to know that he or she is wanted in that company if you don't advertise that? So if you don't share outside of your company that you have an inclusive culture, that you, um, that you value different decision-making, that you value not only different gender, but different approaches, then people may not know about it. And so that is, uh, that is one thing. The second, I would look at the culture and make sure that it is really inclusive uh, because there's a saying that diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. And having a culture in which everyone can feel that his or her opinions are valued, that uh, a culture in which equal chances are given, that doesn't mean the same approach, but equal chances, equal opportunities, then such corporates, uh, they attract uh, different genders. So that is uh, another element. And the third element would be to look at the recruitment process, uh, to speak with uh, executive search companies, to ask for more diverse candidates on long and short lists, to have a look the way job openings are advertised 
And the other element that uh, has been proven successful is also to actually expand um, networking and to expand uh, how you think about hiring people. So think about also non-obvious candidates. Uh, think uh, about giving chances. So for example, uh, while we are speaking only about the board level, so the highest level, in many developed countries it is said that one of the barriers that women face is that they don't have the first experience. So to be on board, first someone has to believe in you and has to give you and has to appoint you for the first time. So it's also important that if uh, any corporation is looking for diverse uh, people in decision making uh, positions, that has to be ready to give people chances and also to give women chances to, to be able to advance them uh, and to understand that it is, uh, that it is, it is done because of, um, diverse uh, people, they make better decisions and that that is the benefit uh, for the company, that is the benefit for, for the employees. So that constant hiring process, that thinking outside of the box, looking for broader candidates and then once you have them making sure that the culture is really inclusive and that it allows them to reach their full potential those are the uh, those are the um, uh, uh, the thoughts that I would I would share with that CEO and I can tell you that at 30% club we've also checked whether there are more women in like um, stereotype men industries or, or whether there is a link or not and it actually turns out that uh, within sectors, then there are uh, quite many women on boards of financial institutions. So the finance, or let's say broadly finance and banking uh, sector, uh, on average, there were more than 20% of women. So versus 15.5%, the average for 140 companies, while such sector is retail companies they actually scored really poorly in terms of diversity on boards. Although, within the retail industry, there are quite many women working. And so I would say that we should not look for stereotypes. And we should, uh, and if you are that CEO, you should just encourage women to, to come because there are really various possibilities where you can work. Great, Great. thank you so much for such insightful uh, advice and I think it's very helpful. Um, so let's move to the subject of sustainability. So from your experience as you work with businesses on sustainability, what are the key areas that needs to be improved both in Poland and elsewhere? Yeah, that's a very, uh, very interesting uh, question. And indeed we hear a lot about sustainability Sometimes we hear three letters, E, S, G, environment, social governance, governance from corporate governance, the way companies are run and managed. And I would say that indeed there's a lot of de debate about that, but my experiences show actually that not that many corporates actually report ESG or sustainability data. You know, in Poland, uh, only some 150 companies, the largest listed companies, are obliged to report data from the so-called non-financial area. Uh, so the EU non-financial directive uh, was introduced to Poland, uh, but it only applies to the largest companies. And I would say actually that that knowledge on how to report non-financially and what to report it hasn't still reached the small and medium enterprises that the sustainability discussions, they are still at the level of the largest companies. But I'm hoping for that to change from two reasons. Uh, first of all, the EU is uh, taking on many measures so as to increase the number of companies that should report data from ESG sphere. And there is a proposal for a new directive that uh, is going to um, probably be mandatory for many more companies. And that will probably, they will probably have to report uh, the ESG data for 2023. So there is still some time. Uh, and the second element is uh, financing. So I see potential in banks, in financing institutions that also have uh, obligations that 
that EU is putting on them, uh, and uh, who also have strategies to e to finance more of the green investments. Yeah, so that is uh, the second incentive I would see for companies picking up uh, in terms of ESG. So the advice I would actually give to corporates in terms of sustainability is to focus on materiality. Material means that that is that element that would impact the decision making process. And once we speak about sustainability, I'm sure that you've heard the word greenwashing many, many times. And it actually results that, uh, as you've stated, a lot is being said about sustainability. But what is important uh, to do is actually for corporates to address those elements that can impact, that can impact their bottom line, that can impact their future, and that can actually impact the society or the environment. So there are many definitions of materiality and the standard setters actually disagree uh, between one another. But my advice is for corporates to run materiality assessment, to actually speak to their stakeholders, to know who their stakeholders are, what those stakeholders' expectations are. And any company has various stakeholders. We as clients can be a stakeholder, employees are stakeholder, but also environment can uh, can be such a stakeholder or uh, or suppliers, uh, for example. So that is one um, one advice I would give to focus on materiality. And the second I would say is to lengthen the horizon. So many management and supervisory boards they tend to think within their own term. So they are appointed for a certain number of years. It can be three, it can be five years in Poland, but the problems we are facing as humanity, they are more long-term ones. So climate issues uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we are facing, they range far more than just five years. So companies need to start thinking that um, that value they are to be building, it should be for not only for shareholders, but for stakeholders, and that it should be really that long term. And when we think about the long term, then we can look what the scientists are predicting. Uh, and even recently, IPCC, an intergovernmental panel for climate change, a body of the United Nations published another report a very pessimistic report saying that uh, a lot of the climate change is actually attributed to human behavior. The European Union uh, wants to take measures and take on plans to sizably reduce uh, carbon emissions. So we, uh, as humanity, we need to step up and each of us can contribute, but also corporates should contribute. And they should have targets. They should understand how carbon um, carbon dioxide emissions uh, are generated, not only uh, by them, but also within the whole value chain. And that's not a simple, uh, simple element. And it's not that easy to come up with measures to reduce uh, those emissions. And we know that as humanity, we don't have that much time, that really the next decade is the time when we should be taking actions. So in my opinion, corporates should be taking actions, uh, countries should be taking actions, government, uh, any of us. So that is my second uh, tip or advice for the corporates to really start thinking about climate risks, to start thinking how the world is going to be changing, where are the risks and where are the opportunities. And to me now is the time to change. And uh, it means gathering data, gathering really important data from the environment, social and governance spheres, uh, gathering and sharing them uh, with financing uh, institutions. And I really hope that uh, the more we speak about these topics, uh, the more it's going to be important not only for banks, for financing institutions, but for institutional investors and for any of you. Because as customers, we have power as uh, clientele. Of, uh, if you want to invest your money, you have a choice. You can invest uh, your money in those funds that actually take ESG criteria into account. That is still a fledgling on the financial markets, but it is developing. 
so I would say to all of you to to start asking questions, to look for the answers, and to think uh, think about ESG those three letters. Thank you so much uh, for for this. Yeah, I wanted to take time from you, and then yeah, this is crazy with the technical stuff. Anyway, thank you so much for this uh, exciting discussion. We touch upon so many interesting subjects here extraordinary career and then moving on to women oriented projects and you know all the data that you provided about the state of the you know women on capital markets and on boards and um, and also sustainability so thank you so much for that and now is a good time to ask questions if you have questions please feel free to ask them my pleasure <laughs> thank you for the invitation so um, we talk about the board about supporting women. There are you have been working, had been working in the male dominated environment. As you said, you were the you were the you were the only woman in the room. So have you faced any challenges or how you were welcomed? Maybe it's a stereotype that that men, you know, don't want women or they treat them differently, or was it not? So what was your experience on that? Um, while I was an equity analyst, I must say that I felt very comfortably within uh, the male-dominated industry. Or I didn't have my gender lens on, so I was a bit accustomed to that because while I was studying, and I was studying quantitative methods or investment banking, there weren't really that many women there as well. Um, and I must really say that I never felt uh, treated um, improperly because of my gender. But that's the beauty of capital and financial markets, that you are paid based on your performance. And that performance is measurable. So if you are a good analyst, that means that you have good performance of your ratings. If you give a buy recommendation, the share price is growing, that means you had a good call. If the clients value your opinion, that means you are a good analyst, they vote for you in ratings, in various ratings. Uh, so it's actually a good place for women because the criteria, they are external and it's not like one person who is judging you, but you are judged, for example, by many, uh, many institutional investors. So it's pretty much that the judgment is fair and it, you are given almost constant feedback because you talk to your clients on a daily basis. So um, capital and financial markets, I think they are a very good place for women and they're transparent. So, um, so that is important. It's uh, not the same in corporations. So if you, if you are a woman and you go through all the, um, you move up the ladder, sometimes you may not really be aware how much your male colleagues uh, are being paid. And in Poland, we do have gender pay gap uh, it's uh, it's not the highest, but still it's uh, more than 10%. Uh, so that is uh, something I have not been experiencing on capital markets. But once I moved to once I moved to having my own uh, company, once I sit on boards, uh, and especially when I run a diversity campaign, I do hear voices um, that. Um, that uh, you know that don't value diversity and uh, i hear uh, many voices that say well mm, those actions are not needed because uh, people who are on boards they are chosen based on their competences and what where i agree is that i can say that competence doesn't have a gender but in poland uh, people who are studying more than 50 percent of them are women uh, and it's also within finance or finance and management. And then in those 140 largest companies, 4% CEOs are women. So we are losing those women somewhere. They are not uh, moving up the ladder as fast as, uh, as men are. And in terms of competences, well, uh, as I mentioned that I have a couple of certificates, so I can give you a numeric example. Uh, one of the certificates that I have is ACCA, so it's accounting. Uh, and uh, I ask ACCA, okay, so tell me how many uh, how many women are there and what's the percentage? So it turns out that in Poland there are more than 2,000 people with that designation and roughly half of them are women. 
So it's thousand women that could be CFOs that could sit on supervisory boards and, for example, work in audit committees. So there are plenty of uh, competent women that I, who I believe because of other elements than competence, they are not getting there. They're not getting uh, their seat at the table. ACC is just one example of a certificate. So it's important to recognize that, um, that, that, that diversity really has value. And that value stretches not only to shareholders but to stakeholders, and you have to go for go for it. So this is what what I argue when uh, when I hear uh, those voices while running the campaign. I'm wondering about you know when when you were working um, uh, and giving recommendations by or not, and you know you were an analyst and analyzing different uh, companies. Like I imagine the pressure was huge you know on you so like how did you cope with the with the pressure and um yeah you know the interesting part of being an equity analyst is that you start young and when you are in your 20s you get to ask the challenging questions to ceos of large companies so that's definitely a fun part uh, of being uh, the equity analyst and indeed there is a pressure there is a pressure because you are constantly judged so when you give a rating, you see whether it's working or, or not. Uh, capital markets, they're not always rational. So it's not always the fundamental elements that actually decide on whether the share price moves uh, up or down. So many triggers have to be taken into account. But I guess that working, that capital or financial markets, uh, that they attract people who like working at high adrenaline levels. And I really like that. I really like taking decisions. I really liked it that, you know, there was a news popping up and within a couple of minutes, uh, I was expected to actually know whether it's a good news or bad news and, and give recommendations. But there's also the other side of capital markets. So being an equity analyst, it means that you're working on sell side. You're selling ideas, selling stories. There's also the other side, the buy side, so investors. So there were people who were acting upon my decisions. And I would imagine that that part is even more stressful because I was just giving recommendations. Just should be, um, uh, maybe it's not just I was giving ratings, but people were acting on that. Yeah. So they were investing someone's money. Uh, and I always thought that my job is actually easier than theirs. So that the pressure is actually higher uh, when when you really invest someone's money and you take uh, and you take those decisions. So you can mm -hmm. cope with it, mm -hmm. uh, but you have to like it. Like, like can stuff. you say like what was like the largest you know transaction like you know like someone earned based on your recommendation or something like this? Well, I can I can tell you that um, while I was um, advancing in my career as an equity analyst, well, my my bosses have given me opportunity to transfer to a different industry. So for many years, I was covering stocks from the retail industry, from the IT industry, and I was given an opportunity to cover utilities. That's really, you know, I thought a women subject, but okay. I knew that that's going to be a challenge. I knew I would have to learn a lot about a new industry. But that was also an opportunity because at that time, the largest Polish utilities were to be listed. And I was starting my coverage with the largest utility within the region. It's called Chess. So it's a Czech company. And uh, that was a very important call for me to make. So I spent a lot of time writing my first reports. Uh, writing my recommendation and it was a contrarian recommendation so it was a stock that was very much liked uh, it was uh, a company that was uh, very and I believe still is very well run with very strong investor relations transparency but I thought it's overvalued so I gave a sell rating and the moment I, I gave it I remember that I've done like 70 calls to my clients <laughs> And really just a few of those clients actually agreed with me. So people were telling, well, it's a great stock. Why, why are we supposed to sell it? And um, well, I knew it's going to be tough and it was. Uh, 
Mm, but later on, people started thinking, and my argument started getting across. And uh, my key argument that electricity prices cannot grow uh, in infinity uh, started getting up. And within a couple of months, that actually turned out to be a very successful call. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, that was supposed to be time for your questions, so yeah. <laughs> Do you have any advice for women who are at the beginning of their career path? Maybe they are searching the right career path and they also want that their voice would be heard as your voice is heard in the business. Great question. I believe that, you know, we women, we should stick together. And that's a very, very important advice that, that I would give you. And the second advice I would tell you to um, to think that you know you are enough, that uh, you don't have to really prove to everyone, and that uh, I know now so many women, and they are immensely competent. They have certificates, they have ambitions, and I would tell you to just go for it, and don't be, don't be stressed that maybe at the beginning or somewhere you know with mid your career, that you may want to make turns. There's a good quote from Helena Morrissey, the founder of 30% Club. She says that a career is actually not a ladder. It's more like a labyrinth and that we have to, you know, keep on finding the right way. But the most important is that we go on. And I, I found it important, you know, uh, just to move forward, just to look for opportunities, to use opportunities to try to be flexible and try to say yes. And there's also a good, uh, a good YouTube video that I've seen and it's called Fake It Until You Make It. Oh, I know. Yeah. So many women, uh, yeah, even if we feel insecurities because that's normal, we are human beings, then, you know, it's, I think, I really think it's important to say yes to some of the opportunities even if the moment you are saying yes, you may not really know how you're going to tackle that challenge, then I'm pretty sure that if you spend a day or two or give it a final thought, you will figure out. So I would say that it's important not to miss out opportunities, but also to look for them, to ask people, to ask around, to, to do networking and to communicate what you want to be doing. I was fortunate to gather, you know, the group of volunteers for 30% Club because I started telling people that, you know, I have that idea. I've heard about 30% Club and, you know, I'm looking for how to start it. It took almost two years from, to start from the first discussions with a group of engaged volunteers till the moment that on 9th June this year we had the launch. Uh, but it started because I was uh, reaching out to people and I was telling that, listen, I have an idea and I need help. I need people, you know, who will have ideas, who will help me to, you know, go through with these initiatives. And that turned out to be a very successful way of uh, launching it. Great, great. Thank you so much again for this inspiring conversation. And thank you for all the questions. Um, if you want to ask last last one, and now is the time. And if not, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you.